Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations presents another chapter in the historical series, We Came This Way. Today's story, Valley Forge. December 1777, Valley Forge, crucible of faith, the ordeal of the American Revolution. Valley Forge. It was so different in the spring. The sun was on the green meadow and the scent of wild honeysuckle was on the wind. The kingfisher waited for the shad at Pauling's Forge, while overhead the migrant ducks rising from the sound wound with the school kill. Ice is on the school kill now. Ice and snow. It is winter. Cold. Very cold. The coldest winter in the memory of Pastor Muvenberg. And blood is on the snow of Pennsylvania. A fine dust of hail runs before the wind and covers the bloody footprints. But always the blood reappears. Confirmation in crimson that the army remains. On a rise of ground, a frozen sentry leans into the wind and presents 20 pounds of musket to the officer of the day. The two men shiver and the sentry kneels to bind the rags tighter around the shoeless stumps of his feet. Below in the valley lie the naked, starved rabble of the Continental Army of His Excellency, the Commander-in-Chief, General George Washington. They stand there, the sentry and the officer. The sentry speaks. Begging your pardon, Captain, but what for breakfast? Breakfast, Henry. Yes, Captain. Fire cake and water. Oh, I hoped. Well, what for dinner, Captain? Fire cake and water, Henry. Then, Captain, please, sir, what for supper? Fire cake and water. Fire cake and water. Today, tomorrow, and the next day, fire cake and water. That's all, Henry. May the Lord send that our commissary of purchase live on fire cake and water until perdition. Now, back to your tent, Henry. You might as well freeze where it's a little warmer. <sighs> it's cold in here, Burke. How's Andrew? How do you expect him to be? The fever's worse. Oh, if only we could get him some clear broth. Clear and hot. Aye. If only this cursed war were over. If only I were a hundred miles away. If only you'd keep your fool mouth shut. Oh, I'm sorry, Burke. I'll be quiet. Forgive me, lad. I must crank his my old woman. Henry. Yes, Burke? There is a way to get him some broth. Meat broth at that. Hmm? Can you still ride a horse? Oh, my legs aren't that weak, Burke. But you don't mean... No, none of that. There's a scouting party going out, foraging for food. Let's go with him. Oh, right away, Burke. But Andrew... He's sleeping, lad. The broth he needs, not us. Come on. Captain. Pull it out, Buck. Yes, sir. That meat belongs to me. It's veal, Captain. Fine veal, sir. Put it down, you blackguards. That meat belongs to me. Does it, Farmer? I say the meat belongs to me. Good. Then we can talk business. Where are you bound? Well, that's my business. You go to Philadelphia, Farmer, don't you? I said that's my business. You tell the Lord how and leave us to starve. Yeah, right? Buck, man, easy, I said easy. Farmer, we're not thieves, we're soldiers. The army pays ten pence a pound for veal. It's a good price. Hmm. The British pay ten shillings. You dirty oh, profiteering oh, dog. Back, Buck. Well, I say pull back. Well? Yes, Captain. Back, girl. Back. Farmer, if you are an American, you'll not sell to the enemy and see your own soldiers go without. Uh, I don't know anything about that. Uh, 
Have you silver? No, but we've good continental currency. Continental currency, do you say? Give me a wagon load of your continentals. I'll give you my veal pound for pound. All right, Palmer. You can go. But we shan't forget. No, that will be all forget. December 1777, Valley Fort, the ordeal of our American Revolution. Hunger and sickness and death. Young Henry King and Bert the veteran return to their tents without food and watch their tent night Andrews lie still in fever. Then, wearily, they trudge to Dr. Waldo's surgery for a little medicine for Andrews and some for themselves. You're the next. The name's Burke, sir. All right, Burke. What's we you? Dysentery, Dr. Waldo. A good democratic complaint, Mr. Burke. Go back and rest. Don't you have anything to give me, doctor? I told you what to do. Rest. Yes, I see. Then, doctor, something for Andrews. You saw him last week, sir. The fever's still bad. Mm, I uh, remember. Orderly. Give him some mutton and grog for the sick man. Right away, Dr. Waldo. Is that all, doctor? Mutton and grog. Well, I suppose it's no use. Be thankful for the mutton and grog. There'll be none of it tomorrow. Orderly, take charge. I'm going to see General Washington. General Washington, I come to you direct. We must have more supplies. I know, Doctor. But see General Mifflin. That's his responsibility. If you please, sir. I've been to him many times. It's no use. General Washington, we need straw. Straw, Doctor? What let the horses do without straw? You don't understand, sir. It's for the men. 200 sick men are sleeping on the floor of my surgery. They can't sleep on the floor much longer. Our cattle have better in comfort. Very well, Dr. Waldo. I'll talk to General Mifflin. Thank you, General Washington. And please, sir, vinegar also. Vinegar? Aye, it's for the scurvy. We must have vinegar. I don't ask more now. Only straw and vinegar. All right, Dr. Waldo. I beseech you, sir. There is itchy scabies and, and, and typhus. By day and by night, I amputate throats and fingers and toes and arms and legs, sir. More than a man can stand. There's galloping consumption among the men. And the French disease... Oh, tell me the details, doctor. I'm sick myself. We're all sick. I'm tired. Dr. Waldo, I'm so tired. <laughs> Come from our allies, from the French. Oh, it's a food castle. Better than food, Bert. Listen, men. The commander in chief, General George Washington, congratulates the army on the arrival of a French vessel at Portsmouth Harbor. He carries a cargo. Of... Listen, men. A cargo of 40 brass cannons, four pounders, men, 19 9 inch mortars, 509 inch bombs, 4,120 <laughs> have to keep a better watch to the fire or they'll lay us out like cords of wood. Not for a while, Andrews. Henry, fetch some rails. But, Burke, it said Washington forbids burning the farmer's rails. Good. Then we'll burn the farmer's house. I shan't freeze. Fever and frost, it's more than I'll bear. They're not all bad, Andrews. Some of the farmers brought a little food today. It's not them, it's the other. The pious, psalm-singing patriots who carry their produce to the British. I hate them. Yes, in the burgers of Philadelphia. They feast with the red coat. Turn coat and red coat. It's the same to me. There's many a good Hessian soldier sits fat and cozy around the stew pot with the wife of a continental soldier. Oh, I think it's going to drive me mad. Here, Andrews. Better take some cold water. <laughs> they say it's good for the fever. Andrews, why don't you go to the surgery? It's hard for Dr. Waldo to come here. The boy's right, Andrews. Dr. Waldo's a good leech. No, I'll stay here. I can't bear the smell of the surgery. The sweet stink of putrefaction. If I'm to die, I'd sooner die here. Inside there. Inside the tent. Why is no sentry posted? It's 
It's not my turn, Captain. Is it yours, Buck? No, sir. I've just come. Then it's yours, Andrews. And if it is, Mr. Andrews, I don't like your tone. Stand up when you address an officer. The man is ailing, Captain. Never mind that. Stand up, Andrews, and to your post. I'll go. I'll go if you give me food. I have none to give. I said go to your post, soldier. No bread, Captain. No soldier. Pay him no mind, sir. He's with typhus. Uh, I'll go for him. Bert, you've just come back. Let me go instead. Thanks, lad, but it's all right. For an old hand like me, this cold isn't so bad. Give us your scarf, Henry, and another wrapping for the feet. <clears throat> you won't report Andrews, Captain, will you? He's not accountable now for what he says. I understand, Bert. You're a good man. I won't report him. Now go to the post. <laughs> Did you find him? Well, not a sign of Burke. Andrews, there isn't a trace of him. I can't understand it. It's not like him to be gone so long. He should have been back two hours ago. Where could he go? Oh, I tell you, I don't know. Did you look for tracks in the snow? Oh, Andrew, I, I didn't think of it. I, I'm a fool. Never mind that, Henry. Help me up. Where are you going? Where do you think? He'll be taken for a deserter if he's found. He'll be shot. Oh, you can't go, Andrews. You're sick. I'm going to look for him myself. December of 1777. Looking for Bert, the veteran soldier. Looking in the Pennsylvania snow for tracks. Hoping. Going further from the camp. Moving out of bounds. While Andrews waited. Burning up with fever and fear. Bert! Oh, thank God. Did you follow me, lad? Uh, you'll be reported missing. They'll take you as a deserter. Gee, are you crazy, Henry? Then, then why? Look, there, on the road. Deer tracks. Oh. All the way through the woods to the Percy Oman Road. Somewhere nearby, there's a deer run. Meet Henry. Meet for Jack Andrews. Bert, someone's coming. Why, well, nothing to hide. Stay right with me, boy. Bert, it's the captain. Whoa there. Who goes on the road? It's us, Captain. Jonathan Burke and Henry King. Hello. And why are you out of bounds? We're seeking game, Captain. Is that so? Go back to your tent. Both of you. You know better. It's to know better, sir, that a man in our tent is perishing for the lack of a bit of fresh meat. I'm truly sorry, Burke, but don't go any further. Oh, there isn't a man in the regiment knows the woods better than Burke, Captain. It makes no difference. Go on back. Ain't no man to stop me, Captain. Not even General Washington himself. Mr. Burke, do you rebel? Rebel? <laughs> the word is apt, Captain. Why not? The colonies are rebels. We're an army of rebels, aren't we? Please, Captain, he's lightheaded. He hasn't eaten Don't him. interrupt, lad. Captain, I ask you. What man set foot in America who wasn't a rebel? Enough doctrine, Burke. Go back to your tent. Here's more doctrine, Captain. Good democratic doctrine, sir. My musket. What do you mean, Burke? There's a charge of gunpowder in my musket, Captain. That's what I mean. It makes me the equal of his lordship. Mister, do you threaten me? Well, sir, you have only your sword. For the last time, go back to your tent. I'm going back. With me, Captain. I shall have to do my duty, Mr. Burke. I shall have to report you. Get up. You report us for desertion, Buck. <laughs> no, Henry. For insubordination, perhaps, but not desertion. He's no cold, formal aristocrat like some of the other officers. He doesn't stand on his rank. Let's go, Henry. The game won't wait for us, nor will Andrew's fever. <laughs> That got him. What's the matter, boy? You're shaking all over. Am I? Buck fever. <laughs> you shot at a man at Trenton without flinching, but you tremble before a deer. Oh, curse the war that makes a lad like Who's you. Who's there? Oh, we're in for it, Buck. They heard the shot. Looks like we 
Mrs. Jonathan Burke and Henry King will stand summary court martial tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Those are the charges against them, General Washington. I see. Uh, gentlemen, uh, what have you to say? You can have a lawyer if you wish. Captain Edison has sent word that he'd be happy to represent you. Did he, General? We won't forget that. But if you don't object, General, I'd like to speak for myself and the lad. I have no objection. Proceed. Thank you, General Washington. <clears throat> General Washington, uh, gentlemen, I've served the Army since the beginning. The boy since he was 16. We know that, Mr. Burke. The muskets we carry, they're our own. The uniforms, our own rags, sir. We haven't been paid, we've been sick, we've been in hunger. Yet I think I don't complain of that. Yes, I've complained about a good many things like the other men. But complaint for an American is no sin. <laughs> well spoken, Mr. Burke. Thank you, sir. The lad and me fight for the colonies. We were at Brandywine in Germantown. Do you think if we didn't desert then, we'd do it now? Oh, yes, sir. I admit to leave my post, but you know why. And the lad went to find me. We aren't deserters, sir. That's the whole truth. Are you done, Mr. Burke? Just one more thing, if I may be allowed, sir. I was one of the sons of liberty. Every man speaks his own way for freedom. You've seen some men who sold beef to the enemy and thought they did it for freedom. But I ask you, sir, have you known one carpenter, one cordwainer, one mechanic to betray the cause... If I offend in saying that, sir, well, I'm sorry. But I tell you again, the lad and me are good Americans. What, uh, uh, Mr. Burke, what is an American? Um, an American? <laughs> I don't right, don't rightly know, sir. Unless it's what a man is and not what he has. Hmm, a philosopher. Tell me, Mr. Burke. Do you make texts like Bishop Barclay when the enemy approaches? <laughs> no, sir. I leave texts for Lord Howe. How so? To explain to his majesty why he wins every engagement and yet cannot defeat us. <laughs> <laughs> now, I like you, Mr. Burke. I think you're a good soldier. Because of it, I'm sorry to say that nothing you've told us has altered our decision. Everything you've told us convinces me that you are fine men, both of you. But an army rises and falls on discipline, and you have broken discipline. I'm sorry, Mr. Burke, but for the good of the army, we shall have to make an example of both of you. Jonathan Burke and Henry King, it is the order of the court-martial, General Washington presiding, that for the offenses committed, you are each to receive 20 strokes of the lash. I warn the men present against any demonstration or outcry. Provost, 20 strokes. Burke, where's Burke? Easy, Henry, easy now. Burke's asleep, he's all right. Was the cold more than the lash? The brutes, the filthy brutes. Andrews, go back to your blanket. You mustn't be up. You're... That's all right, Henry. I'm stronger than you think. I'm Jack Andrews, where I spit no grass grows. Well, how can you joke? I'll joke or go mad. What shall you have? Water. Andrews, some water. It's in my hand, boy. Here, hold up your head. <laughs> More. More, Andrews. No more. You'll get sick. Oh, why did he go off with the deer? The dumb, scuttle-faced fool. You'd have done it for him, wouldn't you? Yes, I would. Henry, I hate them for doing it. Oh, they weren't unfriendly. It's the first time I've seen Washington so close. His nose is pitted with a box, Andrews. But he laughed. You could see he was pleased by what Burke said. The greater the crime, then. I hate the army, Henry. I'm not going to stay another day. Henry, let's go. Let's get out. Let's quit. Andrews, you don't mean that. I'm sick. Sick, do you hear? I'm not going to die in this tent. 
Better in the snow where a man can fall asleep and think he's warm. Andrews. Burke. I thought you were asleep. No. Not asleep. But too weak to talk. Throw a stick on the fire. Go to sleep. I'm glad you heard. My mind is fixed. If you and Henry won't go with me, there are others who will. Andrews. You can't quit now. They whipped you. It's no skin off your back. You let them beat you when you say that? Oh, you man. Jonathan Burke, will you snivel and smile and give a kiss for a lashing? You're sick, Andrews. But I'm not mad. You were lashed. I had a fair trial. Your back isn't fair, Jonathan Burke. It'll heal. Go back to your blanket. Oh, no. I'm going. How? You're going to stay here. Why? Tell me why. You belong here. You belong here. That's why. Men like you don't run from a fight. You just can't run away, Andrews. The fight follows. And you have to fight alone. What's the difference? You know what it is. No single man can make the fight. But all men together. That way. Together. Andrews, you can't run from the fight and find what you look for. What you look for is right here. Who's fight? The merchants? The aristocrats? Yes, the merchants, the aristocrats, if you will. But your fight, too. Everyone's fight. One thing at a time, Andrews. Curse you, Jonathan Burke. May heaven curse you. Then you'll stay. May you have the black clock. But you'll stay. I hope your teeth rot with the scurvy. But you'll stay. Yes, I'll stay, I'll stay. Because you believe me. Quit. Don't play me. I said I'll stay. What more do you want? Oh, Andrews. Andy, I... I want you to stay only if you want to stay. It can't... It... It mustn't be otherwise. Quit. Quit, Burke. It's so. You know it's so. I'm no deserter. Go, Captain. I want to talk. You need sleep, General Washington. Uh, let Lord Howe sleep. I'm depressed. Tired and weary and depressed. <sighs> you have tribulations enough for one man. I doubt myself, Captain. Am I worthy of the fidelity of the men? I've always failed. That isn't true, sir. Ah, but it is true. It's always been true. At Fort Necessity 30 years ago, I failed. The Ohio campaign failure. It hasn't changed. New York, Germantown, Brandywine, failures, all of them. The campaign against Canada, miscarried, lost. Sir, you are a rock that grows on adversity. Before God, I hope you're right. Captain, this is a great country. There are two million people in it. Something will come of them in spite of our failures. In spite of the Congress that sits and talks and sits and talks and promises... Captain, we need a miracle. Where is there a miracle, Captain? Where? Valley Forge was the miracle. The miracle of 1777 and 1778. Out of it came the vibration of deathless music of our American Revolution. Out of the ordeal and the blood on the snow and the rabble in the tent, something emerged. First, spring came, and the stricken, starved men stirred and quickened in the thin April sun. Near where the New Hampshire engineers had bridged the school kill, the men took ashes and sand and washed their rags in the river, and they were refreshed and clean. And that was a miracle. Then, another miracle. The shad and the thousands came boiling up the river to spawn. At Pauling's Ford, the half-crazy men stretched a net and rowed into the river, driving the fish before them. They ate the first fish raw. Then they cooked it and ate more. Then they salted the rest. A fat little man named Stoyman began to drill them. Yes, he drilled them. They were awkward. They vexed him. He lost patience. But he drilled them. And they became an army. They became the disciplined army of the American Revolution. The army that marches still. The army that marches now. The army of freedom that will never die.
Tonight we have our guest speaker, Martin B. Mangan, administrative assistant to the chairman, War Finance Committee of Illinois. Mr. Mangan has important information to give us on war bonds. Mr. Mangan. Today is the anniversary of the Bill of Rights, which grew out of the struggle of the hungry and ragged little band of colonists at Valley Forge. Today's war, too, is being waged for the freedoms and rights of individuals. The bonds that help finance it are called the People's Bonds. The Series E war savings bonds, which were designed as a protection to the individual, are built around the principles written in the Bill of Rights. They may be owned only by individuals. The owners alone have the right to redeem the bond. The Treasury Department may not call this bond prior to maturity. The owners have the right to hold the bond during the full 10-year period so that the total 2 9 and 9 tenths percent per annum rate of interest may be realized. The bond has no value to anybody other than the registered owner. A 60-day redemption clause was inserted in this bond by the Treasury Department to stimulate individual savings, fully realizing that when an emergency arose and the owners may need cash hurriedly, these bonds could be converted readily. The bonds, if lost, stolen, burned, or destroyed, will be reissued to the owner by the Treasury Department upon proper application and statement of facts. This feature is not true of currency. While Series E bonds are identical with currency, both being obligations of the United States government, bonds increase in value and currency does not. The Treasury Department had in mind when creating the Series E bond the safeguarding and protection of the individuals in full accordance with the principle of the Bill of Rights protecting the individuals for whom our present armed forces are fighting so nobly and for whom those at Valley Forge so gallantly fought. The NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter 10 of We Came This Way. Next week, We Came This Way will present Lafayette. A handbook containing background information with suggestions for further reading is now off the press. We shall be happy to send you at cost this valuable We Came This Way handbook, especially written for the current series. Send 25 cents to cover the cost of printing and mailing to We Came This Way, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. Again, We Came This Way, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. Valley Forge was written by Morton Wissengrad and directed by Albert Cruz. The original music was composed by Dr. Roy Shield. Joseph Galicchio was the conductor. Heard as Jonathan Burke was Mr. Frank Dane. Mr. Norman Gottschalk played Andrews. Mr. John Coons was Henry King. Mr. Arthur Sedgwick was General Washington. The part of the captain was performed by Mr. Arnold Robertson. Dr. Waldo was played by Mr. Jeff Chew. And Clifton Utley was the narrator. This program came to you as a public service feature and is produced by the NBC University of the Air, not only for listeners in this country, but also for our servicemen and women overseas to be transmitted to them wherever they are stationed through the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is the National Broadcasting Company.